colleague who I just met today. We've been talking by email. We act like we know know each other for years, and we're going to pretend like that, but we really haven't. But um, we are therapists in private practice. Jackie, that's kind of her full time thing, I think, right? Is private practice. I'm full time faculty here at UK and the College of Social Work, and I've done private practice part time for about 20 years. So I'll talk with you a little bit about my experience and we want this to be very informal I was going to ask if they could put the chairs in a, in a circle but they get kind of worked up I think about this room or something so if you drop pizza or something just clean it up and you know don't get us banned from here right um, I wonder if we could start out with some quick introductions tell us who you are and what you do can we start with you sure my name is Andine and I'm a first year MSW student here and I also am a full-time caseworker at AIDS Volunteers okay thank you Made with pizza in my mouth. Yeah, of course. I'm Debbie Harden. I'm a recent MSW graduate. Yay. Dr. Jones is my professor. I'm lucky to have a job as a part time psychiatric social worker at Samaritan Behavioral Health in UK's inpatient psych. Good. That's a good uh, practice. I mean, that's a good way to uh, work toward your LTS. I think you see, we, we see about everything. Yeah. That's important. Thank you. Ying, we'll jump up here to you. I'm Ying Liu. I'm from our MSW program. I'm a student in Dr. John's class. I didn't make my students come here. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only <laughs> <laughs> uh, My name is Lauren. Um, I'm an MSW student. I graduated in May. Um, right now, I'm just interning at UK Adolescent Medicine. and. Waiting to get that diploma. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations, you're almost there. Yeah, Ooh. almost. I'm Kimberly Stewart. Um, I did undergrad here doing um, grad at U of L. I um, have been working at the cabinet as a social worker for six and a half years and um, primarily work with birth families and foster parents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Laura. I'm, gonna, I'm getting my MSW. I'm graduating in May also. Um, I'm doing my internship this semester at KVC Behavioral Health. Thanks. Hello, I'm Justin. Uh, I graduated in 2013. Um, I just worked at Eastern State as a <coughs> social worker. I should get my help in a month or two. Kind of you know, up in the air. Great. You're close then. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Jason means I graduated this program two minutes ago. Chad, you an ethics mother <laughs> first class. Uh, now I remember, yes. <laughs> I'm about 50, I'm also a Eastern Standard, about 50 hours away from my else. Great, awesome. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you, sure. Madam, and let you <coughs> kick us off. Is that okay? Um, uh, I'm also a doc student here at UK. Uh, I'm uh, technically second semester. I took two uh, classes post back, so I'm, I'm a little bit uh, further ahead than some of the other second semester students. But um, that's really exciting, uh, so I'm sure that, I know that uh, working toward private practice is your goal right now, but you may be thinking a couple more steps into the future, thinking about the doctoral program here at UK. I was going to tell you a funny story that, um, so here I am with this pen, and I, when I came out of the parking garage today, I realized that I had come off without a pen. And I said, there's no way I can talk to anybody without a pen, because once you've been in private practice as long as I have, you can't think without a pen in your hand. Right? And even if my friends start telling me a story or something, I'm likely to have a pen and start just making notes. <laughs> so that's what you learn when you're in private practice, is that you're always taking notes when people are talking to you. Uh, Pop Walker, does anybody know him? He's, uh, I think he taught in the MSW program, in the, in the BSW program, uh, a, a bunch of years, but he's retired now. He told us that there was a study done once about whether or not um, clients are distracted by that writing and that the studies show that no, that they're definitely not so. So anyway, so uh, pen in hand, uh, but the reason that I wanted to have a pen was because I wanted to, we had a list of things that we were going to cover, I think there's seven bullet points, how to get started in private practice, developing your specialty areas, using social media to expand your practice, I hope you're planning on doing that because I'm not sure what that one is. Um, billing and other money issues, taking care of yourself and growing as a professional, getting referrals, calming your anxiety about being the perfect therapist. But I'm sure that you guys have your own questions that you brought in. We are already heard from, um, 
What's your Kim. name? Sorry. Kimberly. Kimberly. Right, Kim. Mm -hmm. the, of, of one good question <coughs> about how to get an LCSW, about what the step-by-step -step process is to get your LCSW. But I'd like to hear from you guys um, what particular specific questions that you have that aren't on the list or aren't Kimberly's question so that I can make a note of them with my pen and, uh, and then we can be sure to try to cover those. So anybody want to speak up about that? I will. Um, since I haven't started getting my supervision hours yet, it's being talked about. How can I make that work the best way for me? Um, I need an hour of supervision a week. Correct. 200 total hours. 200 total. Right. Um, I believe at least 100 of them have to be face to face. Am I right, guys? You individual, individual, versus individual versus group. Versus group. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, but there's also like a two year, I believe it's two year waiting period after you get your MSW. So they don't want people, you know, within six months after graduating with their master's to get their clinical license. I'm only part-time yeah. anyway, so yeah. it'll take me a while. Yeah, so, so about we, an hour a week is what most people do, and maybe a little group mixed in there. What What can I ask of my supervisor to get the most out of this for me? Sure. Okay. I, I think the relationship with your clinical supervisor is one of the most important that you Will ever have in your career and so I would interview them like you would interview a therapist um, or, or um, you know a teacher or somebody somebody like this somebody you're going to hire because you are going to hire them you're going to pay them so I would ask them about first of all are they what is their sort of what's their way of, do, of doing supervision the supervisor I had Great guy, but he was kind of like, you know, would show up once a week at the hospital and say, you know, what are we going to talk about today? What do you want to talk about? And I'm a sort of an organized person, and I like goals, and I, I was getting kind of stressed about that and anxious. So a lot of what I had to do was on my own. I learned a lot from him, but it was not a methodical sort of, you know, thing that he you did. You had to kind of do it on your own. I did. Pull it out, yes. put it together. Right, so interview them about their personality, but what, you know, the way that they do the, that they do supervision would be my main uh, piece of advice. And I think a good tie-in of that is coming back to actually being in private practice, that that's the kind of thing that, as you pointed out, our, our prospective clients will do with us. So I'll get phone calls constantly. Do you take your own calls or no? Yeah. Sometimes I do, yeah. So um, Blake and I were talking about that before we started that, um, that he has works in an office, <clears throat> a good sized office where all the billing is taken care of, and uh, the scheduling, et cetera, but I'm just a one-man show, so I take all my own phone calls, do all my own insurance, and all of that. Um, so people will call, and, 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 and they want to do this back and forth thing with you, and so they'll be asking you questions. Some of them have a big, huge list like this, and all about what your experience is, and your specialties, and things like that. And I typically say things to them like, you know, your insurance companies, of course, we're, I'm uh, insurance billable, right? And your insurance company doesn't really care how many different therapists you go to uh, in order to find the one who's the right fit for you. So I encourage you to call other people on your list. Uh, if they've given you a list, they typically do. And uh, you know, and just chat with them like you're chatting with me. And, and of course, you know, right away, that's some sort of reverse psychology because right away, they, oh no, they want to talk to me. And they keep talking to me, and they keep talking to me. And actually, that was one of the things that was on my list in, in terms of building your practice, is that it really, you do have to be a salesperson and so when, uh, when that person calls me, I, I focus on that person and giving them all the information that they want and need from me. And, uh, and typically, I, I get them in my office. That every once in a while, I lose one or two, but, uh, but most of the time they end up coming in. And I'll also say, uh, I've had people that, um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> reverse this and say, I have had people who have uh, been to multiple therapists trying to find this right fit. And uh, and so then I might tell the person on the phone, you know, I've, I've had that happen and most of the time people do stay with me. And so um, I think that is a selling point as well. So whatever you can do to sell yourself on the phone, I think that's the most important detail is that when you're building a private practice, if you're fortunate enough to be in an environment where maybe it's 
connected to a doctor's office or something <coughs> like that, and there, and there are lots of referrals coming in from, from that source, it won't be as necessary, but most of the time you do have to end up selling yourself. I have had doctors, uh, I have been connected with doctors over the years who have made referrals to me, and that's always boosts up the numbers when you have something like that, but nevertheless, you're gonna have to sell it. Yeah, and so you have um, areas of specialty in your clinical practice, right? Can you talk about how you came to that and what that's like for you? Yeah, well for me, my uh, specialty area is personality disorders, and so it used to be called Access 2, and most of you probably know that that's no longer Access 2. Big smile over here. You want personality disorders too? We, we see a lot. Right. And so, uh, in inpatient, right. And so now it's over on Access 1, uh, back um, with, um, you know, with traditional mental health disorders. My area of specialty is not so much working with personality disorders, although I do a lot of that. Uh, I have, I've done the DPT groups, I work with the, with the borderline personality disorder, um, dependence, uh, avoidance, um, but my, I consider my area of expertise to be in helping people who are victims of personality disorders. So this may be a woman who's married to a narcissist or a, um, uh, even a, a psychopath, and she's wondering, what's wrong with me? And I'm there to help her say that, well, you know, uh, or help her conclude that maybe it's not really me, maybe it's really him. So I love personality disorders, and, um, and that's going to be my research interest in the doc program as well. So about your areas of specialty? Well, um, I sort of fell into mine, so just to back up a second, I got my master's here in 1996 on the sixth floor down there, which is, yeah, I've never left here for all these years. Um, I fell into clinical social work. My last practicum was at St. Joseph Hospital in psychiatry, and I didn't know anything. I just didn't know what I wanted to do, and I absolutely loved that job. I told somebody at Eastern State Hospital the other day, I took my students over there for a visit, I said, you know, if I wasn't doing teaching and doing this stuff, I would come work here because I, I love the hospital setting because you do learn so much. And so I learned a great amount there and got my LCSW there. Um, that's the other thing. If you can get somebody to pay for your clinical supervision, do that. That will save you a couple thousand dollars probably. Um, and while I was there, the hospital opened this place called St. Um, Behavioral Medicine Network. And so after I got my LCSW, I could see people down there just you know, a few at, at a time. I've continued working with that group all of these years. And the main reason that I have is because you know, I've done other things, including you know, now I'm a full-time faculty member here. But I show up there, they're really nice people to work with. And that's a, that's a great consideration. If you work with somebody who um, you have conflict with, or for an agency that expects you to see, you know, 12 people a day and bill, you know, bill you to death, you're not going to last there. So I like them just personally. They're really nice, and they do all of the scheduling, all the billing. I get a flat fee for my uh, just showing up. I just show up and do the work, and I've that's fit in great with my family and you know my other jobs and stuff. So um, I think we both bring kind of different perspectives about. You know how we, what we like doing. Um, Comcare was who I, was yeah. for, who I worked for to uh, have my supervision paid for. So I just want to throw that out. Yes, and so you might. Well, you won't make a lot of money at Comcare. I'll just <laughs> say that you won't. But you'll get supervision, right? And that means a lot. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other, I guess, places in town where they will hire you and thus pay for your supervision? That you guys might know about? So Comcare. The Ridge. The Ridge, uh -huh. KBC, KBC, <laughs> behavioral health, yeah. Now, doesn't the cabinet pay? pay? Somebody works it. Can't, the cabinet does not pay for supervision. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. <coughs> Those so, are the big ones, right? Comfort care. Yeah, East, the big hospitals. Well, but you know, again, I I can't say enough about a hospital training. I mean, I learned a lot about medications and, you know, there's this debate in social work about should we talk to our clients about medication and some people say, you know, the minute the word medication comes up, you know, you're supposed to say, oh, you know, I can't give you medical advice and I agree with that, but I also think that we need to know about, you know, if somebody says, 
yeah, I'm on you know a bunch of Xanax, and, and I'm just going to stop it. It's really not working for me. I'm going to stop it tomorrow. We're supposed to say, don't do that. You, you can die, and, <laughs> and you'll be really uncomfortable, too. So, you know, again, I think the hospital can help us with that. I had just a, two or three little points that I wanted to make for sure, and I want you to talk, and we want to take your questions as well. Just feel free whenever on the question. Yeah, my, and mine are, I kind of wrote down here on this little uh, sheet that has my bio and my contact information, so please feel free to, um, you know, talk to me at any point. Um, so the, the big stuff that I've learned over time, the first one is to practice self-care, and I think that this work is traumatizing. I had a, my specialty area is working with law enforcement officers. And I had a, just last week, had a police officer, um, I won't go all into because it's really horrifying and, and gross, but he um, knocked, he, he got a call someplace, he was off uh, work, but he took the call anyway. It happened to be a dispatcher that he knew. She was barricaded, she was being held hostage by her husband, basically. He broke the door in and found her basically kneeling on her knees, begging. I mean, she was dead. The guy shot her and killed her. And then he sat on the bed and killed himself. So murder, suicide. This guy was just getting off work, you know? I saw another police officer also getting off work. He had to chase a guy down. The guy wrecked his car, put his gun to his you know, chin like that, and then pointed it at the police officer, and the police officer did what he had to do and shot him in the face. So, I mean, it's that, it's those kinds of stories, and with, with personality disorders, you hear about trauma, trauma, trauma all over. So, I play music. I'm a musician. I love playing music. I grew up in a musical family. I try to run. You can't really tell by looking at me, but I try. You know, I'm really slow, but I try. But finding ways that you take care of yourself. There are some agencies that will literally work you into the ground. They'll get your, you know, I, I had a friend one time who said, yeah, I just saw my 12th person today, or maybe it was 10th or 11th. I was like, mm -hmm. you know, to me, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good on any level. And so that's another reason I've kind of done my part time. So maybe can you talk about like how many people do you see a day? How do you take care of yourself? How do you give yourself breaks and deal with the trauma stuff that you see? Um, also, don't let me forget that because you were talking about police officers, I want to ask uh, segue over to getting referrals because I'm curious how you you got all, all of the business and the police officer. That's very interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Um, okay, so for me, um, I also do it part time. Because when I started out, I had kids, and so, and I don't know if you, uh, those of you who have children or are, are thinking about having children, you might, you might as well know now that they are a lifelong responsibility. Even after they're grown, they're still a responsibility. And so, I've never really bumped out of being part time. So, so I, uh, so I, I go to work at noon, <laughs> which is <laughs> super nice, and and I usually work till five o'clock uh, most days. On Fridays, I'm here with, with the DOC program. But uh, so part time. Um, and of course, that's called a clinical hour, right? So that's a, an hour that you're seeing someone is called a clinical hour because what that means is that that's code for there's a lot more to do other than that hour that you're actually seeing people. So, but I guess, and to answer your question, um, I think that is how I take care of myself is that I, that I, uh, that morning time is for me. And so I, by the time I go to work at 12 o'clock, I'm very uh, refreshed and ready for the day, and I take care of all of my errands and home stuff and all of that sort of thing. And so, uh, so I would never work 10 or 12 hours a day. I do remember when I was first getting my practice started, it was actually in um, uh, the, the summer before 9-11. And uh, at the time, I, in order to pay my rent on my building, on my office, I was, uh, because I don't know how easy it is these days, but back then you had to get on, on the insurance panels. And that took a while. Some of them took a year. Like maybe Anthem, the biggest one that I have right now, took a year to get on their panel. So I had to pay the rent while I was waiting to get on the insurance panels. And so I uh, got trained in doing hypnosis. And so then I was uh, doing hypnosis to pay the bills. 
And so it was basically hypnosis to stop smoking and um, lose weight. So it was, my business was so huge that I would have, I, I put a little ad in the Herald Leader and I would have to set aside an entire day just to take the phone calls. So huge, huge numbers of people. It's not very much fun, honestly, because people really, you know, hypnosis is really about people expecting you to um, just open up their head and fix them. But I did it, you know, to pay the bills. And then 9-11 happened. And after 9-11, no, my hypnosis business fell to zero. Nobody wanted to get, let go of any of their bad habits. So, but luckily about that time, uh, my, the insur I got on all the, the insurance panel stuff started coming around, and so I started doing more traditional therapy. And then I, when I had the two to look at, you know, one against the other, I found that I really liked my clients awake <laughs> and talking to me rather than in a hypnotic state. So, but uh, what was the point of that? <laughs> Self-care and, you know, um, not... Part, oh, yeah. and actually, this is what it was. Part time is that it was after 9/11 that I said, you know something, life is too short, and I am. And, and back then, I was working a lot of hours, and I was working evenings, and I was basically working whenever they wanted me to see them, just so that I could build my practice. But it was after that that I realized the importance, really, of what you're talking about, of self care, and of just, you know, not just personally, but in the world. And so then I, I stopped working that much, and that's when I cut back to like. That's when I started saying, here's when I'm available. <laughs> now, if we can work that out, fine. And if we can't, you know, then I'm sure your insurance company will give you a list of other people that you can see. And so I started putting my own needs first at that point. And, uh, and that is definitely how I still am today. Yeah, and isn't that what we tell our clients? I mean, we sort of, we have to be, I think we have to be the models of self-care for our clients. And, and so, you know, I can tell, and I think you probably can too, when you're, getting like I need a I need a break I need a vacation you know or I've, I've heard too much and I need to go um, take a drive or you know do something to um, it's like working with police officers you know they see the most horrifying things and then they go hang out with other cops or they go drink or you know they go work more they work more police out because that's what they know how to do so talking with them about having a life outside of their job is um, really important, I think. And vacations are huge. Vacations are absolutely a necessity. Even little one-day yeah, trips. Absolutely. To, yeah, yeah. yeah. So referrals, if you're prepared to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so for me, we, our clinic does the employee assistance program for the Lexington Police Department. Uh -huh. And so I just started seeing more and more of these mostly guys over the years. And I just got really interested in working with them. I, I think this is it's kind of embarrassing, but you know that show Cops? You know, I've watched that for 20 years. I mean, my wife just laughs at me every Saturday night. I'm, I'm like, you know, and I know all the police codes and stuff. She's like, why don't you just go be a cop and get done with it? And I'd be a terrible cop because I'm too emotional. You know, I'd be fired the first day. But so I said you're a social worker. That's right. C -C that's right. right. And I do, I do lots of ride-alongs. I have a friend who's on the force. He's like, you know, anytime you want to ride along, and and that. You know, cops are pretty standoffish, and especially if you describe yourself as a counselor or, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just ride with them and go to their calls, and, you know, by the end of it, they're usually, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to learn about their life, and they appreciate that. And so when they come to therapy, they sort of know who I am. And I do, the other way I've got referrals is do um, free trainings for them. So I've developed the training around transitioning from, you know, the street to home. The need is huge, and I want to put a plug in if you guys are at all interested in this area. We're trying to develop um, a training for therapists who work with police officers because there's the need is just so great, and they're um, you know most of them that I found want they want to, they love being a police officer. They don't know how to turn off the stuff in their head. All they know to do is work or drink or hang out with other cops. So. They struggle in their marriages. There's a high suicide rate among cops. They don't talk about that, but there is. Um, so anyway, that's kind of how I got my referral base for them. What kind, we're, talk, we're talking a lot here. What kinds of questions do you guys have? Well, for the spirit of transparency and, and other you know, MSWs, 
one thing that Eastern states really help, you know, Mason and I kind of hear from psychiatrists in the area that have formerly worked in private practice. And I just, it'd be really interesting to hear from you how you feel that the climate in Kentucky has changed um, as what I've gotten from psychiatrists and LCSWs that, you know, with the, the integration of MCOs or managed care organizations, it's, it's fairly difficult. You know, in, in Kentucky, to have any kind of practice, um, and, and what you guys could speak to in that regard. Um, within the last decade, it seems like there's been traumatic, you know, significant um, hurdles in providing care uh, for private practice. Good question. You want to start? Or uh, you want to? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say this much. I'm sure that you can add to this as well, Blake. But um, having a having a niche in private practice setting is very important. So for example, mine is personality disorders and I do have somewhat of a reputation in the community I'm among a couple of doctors for that. But uh, have, finding, finding a niche is important. So for example, the woman downstairs from me does DUI groups. And I think they're very lucrative because she drives like a Mercedes or something, okay? They are. And so, There's lots of drunk drivers out there. <laughs> and so I said to myself, you know, that would be a really neat thing. I actually checked into it a little bit. Um, uh, you have to have someone who has a CCDC, uh, but nevertheless, I can hire that. But you know, at, at some point, at the end of the day, I said to myself, you know, that's really not my interest. I'm glad she's found it and she drives a Mercedes, but it's not mine. And so, you know, there's a book called Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow. And so I sort of, you know, I feel like that's the right philosophy to have, that I really love what I do, and so the money seems to work out fine for me. But Finding something where something you can make some money off of as a niche, and then that way it pays for the time that you're with your clients that may or may not be very lucrative. I mean, on the one hand, if you think about it, let's take let's take a dentist. If if a dentist, this is the way I've said it before, that if a dentist all he all he did in his office was clean teeth, that wouldn't be very good lucrative dental practice, right? But instead, you know, they do crowns and they do and they do all these really expensive procedures. But therapists are sort of like dentists who only clean teeth, right? And so, because we, we can only bill for that one hour, there, there are no add-on services at all, and so even though it may sound pretty fantastic to be making, on average, $60 an hour, that sounds really good, but then you've got your rent and uh, your utilities, and um, if you're you know, paying anyone else to help you do billing and things like that, then all of that comes, comes out of there. But that's why you need some sort of a niche thing. Um, another one that I have thought about over the years was uh, mediation. Uh, it may be more lawyers do it, but I think they do have social workers doing that as well. So there are definitely some areas that you can just, just keep your eyes open uh, on the lookout for areas where you can supplement your income through uh, other than just sitting in a chair or seeing a client, which to me is the favorite thing to do, but not necessarily the most lucrative. What do you think, Blake? Yeah, there, there's a, um, I don't know if you guys listen to the Social Work podcast or not, but there's a terrific, it's a great resource for all of us, but there's a woman named Jul Julia Hanks, Dr. Julia Hanks, she's an LCSW, and she was just on the Social Work Social Worker podcast a couple weeks ago, talking about all this stuff, about diversifying, about um, social media, that was one of the things we wanted to talk with you about, is having a Facebook page and Twitter and you know, she's all over that stuff, and um, she writes a blog, I believe, and a couple years ago, her blog was the most searched, or the, or, I don't know, somehow Google counted it the most, it, it came up the most Google <laughs> search depression, the word depression, LCSW private practice, and, and that was just through, you know, hooking in and being, you know, familiar, using social media. So what is the Social Work Podcast? I don't know about it. Yeah, it's called the Social, Social Work the Social Work Podcast, let okay. me tell you right Easy here. Enough. You don't know how to get podcasts on these things, right? Um, yes, it's called Social Work Podcast. Okay. And this was on January 13th, Private Practice for Social Workers, interview with Dr. Julie, Julie, J-U-L-I-E, Hanks. She's an LCSW, uh, and she owns her own business, and so she, uh, you know, like she'll get on CNN if there's some sort of, if they're doing a thing on depression or something. CNN will call her. And, and is that her specialty then? Depression? Um, 
I, I, I think so. But she talks about having your, what your message is. Like, so when people get on your website, like for mine, you know, I clearly state I work with police officers. Here are some trainings that I offer. Um, so they see that, and they should know a little bit about you as well. So, so that's, that's a good one, Julie Hanks. What other kinds of questions do you have? Yeah. Um, I'm asking this question with no knowledge. I'm just going on what other people have talked to me about. There's supposedly people out in Lexington, Kentucky, um, who are counseling with just an MSW without their LCSW. So can you speak on that? Um, I don't know if they're talking about Christian counselors or if they're just talking about social workers that are just doing counseling. But that sounds a little scary to me. And what's your it's opinion on it? Is it happening? And should I it be not happening? I have knowledge of it. Of course, that, that would not be board approved. If no, no. Right right. Word, that, no. That, that would be technically illegal as a social worker. But now a social worker who has an MSW could probably bump out of that, and like you said, do some sort of Christian counseling in their church yeah. or some, some other kind of counseling, but it wouldn't be part of wouldn't the social worker. Wouldn't be a private practice. You can't call yourself a clinical social right. worker. You need to be licensed. I don't know any insurance companies that would pay. I mean, it has to be all private pay. Okay. Good point, right. You know, so they could not bill insurance. That's the beauty of the LCSW is that it's very right. versatile. I think they were referring to the people that are doing it and they say, I don't bill insurances. So yeah. I, either cash only or you bill yourself through your insurance. Um, you file your own insurance maybe, but not a good idea on your... I don't think Well, they still have to be, even if they build their own insurance, they still have to be a provider <coughs> who is on that insurance okay. plan. And so I, I have a, I don't think that would be covered. Okay. Um, I didn't think so. so yep. I think, it's I think you'd be better off to stay in the within the confines of the social work board. I totally agree. More, more billable. And that's the thing, too, if you're trying to build a practice, chances are, I mean, I don't know about you, but I do fantasize from time to time about being only self pay. Of and course. We, we all, I think we all fantasize about it, but you have to be pretty darn popular to be able to pull that off. And so that's always a dream, that's a goal. <coughs> but um, I have pretty much all the business I want right now. I don't, I don't, most, most weeks I run with a waiting list. And uh, so I, I don't need a lot more business, but the only way to cut that back, I've determined, is to at some point go to out pocket, and then that will clear things out a little bit. But then on the other hand, you know, gosh, I love my clients and, um, you know, I'm not sure that I would want to close the door on people who have insurance and want to use their insurance, but it's definitely something I fantasize about. Yeah, we get criti and I say we as a profession get criticized for, for treating the worried well. I hear that sometimes, right? With, you know, you see that lawyer who, you know, what problems does he have? You should be you should be a social worker and, you know, working at Comp Care or something like that, you know. I don't buy that. I do lots of free stuff. I give of myself in many, many ways to the world. And you know, I had a I had a professor. I don't know if you know Lane Veldkamp. I do. Lane. Very well. He was yes. he was the only professor I had when I was a student here who got up in the class and said, you know, there's really nothing wrong with making money and making a decent and good living being a clinical social worker. You know, all the other faculty members were like, you know, you have to just you know, you just have to struggle. I mean, that was the message. It's like, you know, <laughs> clinical social work was not where they wanted to go. That, that's changing now. But I've always ap appreciated that advice. So, you know, the other way that I have taken care of myself is to do things like CEU presentations, um, trainings. Um, the other day, I went over to the health department. There, um, the guy in charge, Dr. Leach, I think is his name, is very critically ill. You know, he's getting ready to die, and so they just told their staff that, and that you know, cause this is very upsetting because they all loved him. So I went over there, and um, you know, consulted with them and met with some people. I've done critical incident uh, debriefings around, you know, like if there's a flood or you know, just 
things like that that just sort of get you out of the office, get you uh, known. That's the other thing, you know, you need to be good at promoting yourself. who you are and yourself. You know, that's really important. And I don't, I don't think social workers are great at that overall. We're a little too humble. But we do good, good work. We're, you know, if you're paying a psychologist however much, you know, I think clinical social workers can do just as good. Yes, I'm glad you ended that way, because that was kind of my question, is I feel like there's some tension sometimes about who thinks who is better qualified to do therapy, a psychologist or a clinical social worker. Yeah. How much do you guys bump into those attitudes, and how do you confront them in a good way? I don't confront them. I, I think they're, I think it's the wrong question. I think psychologists are trained to work with individuals, and they're, many of them are trained very well in the testing. I mean, I work with a couple testing. psychologists. They test. They do a good job. I love social work because of the holistic nature of the way we see people. Um, I'll never forget working at the hospital and having a woman they were treating for depression. And nobody asked her anything about her home life. This was over the weekend. Monday morning I came in and said, you know, they were getting ready to discharge her. And they're like, we've tried all this stuff, you know, and she's not getting better. Well, it turns out that she was from Eastern Kentucky and married like 30 years. And almost nightly, her husband had raped her. He just had sex with her, whether or not she wanted it or not, and most of the time she didn't. And nobody asked her that question. And that was horrifying to me, because they were interested in, well, this medicine didn't work for her, this, that one didn't. And the psychologist came up, well, you know, she has some cognitive distortions. Nobody asked her about being sexually assaulted every night. Do you think that contributed to her being depressed? Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to be snarky about that, but I, I think that clinical social workers are very well trained um, to provide therapy in a, in a holistic way. I would argue that big time. Have you guys seen, there's a statistic that it used to be, um, when I was in the MSW program here at UK, was that over 50% of all therapy counseling is done by, by LCSWs. But, and then someone told me recently that that number has gone up over the years. So I don't know how, where it is now. It may be, I think this, this is one of the professors that may be 75% now. So it, we really are the vast majority of the frontline workers for, in, in the counseling and, and therapy um, profession. So, yeah, and whereas the psychologists do more testing, you, you will find a psychologist on occasion who does counseling. It's fairly rare, I think, in this city. Uh, and psychiatrists, of course, they're doing medication. And it is practically unheard of for them to do any therapy. <laughs> well, because they're too expensive, right? You're paying them, I don't know, four, four hundred dollars an hour, and so uh, they'll do a, a, medica a med check for 15, 10 or 15 minutes, but they're not gonna do uh, an hour of therapy with you. It'd be way too expensive. The insurance companies don't do it like that. So part of it is that, that everything has gone to more and more specialization. But we are the ones who aren't really specialized. We're, 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 we're trained as generalists, and so we see it all, we do it all, and, uh, you know, and that's kind of the beauty of it, really, for us. Yeah. Good question. How are we doing on time? We're doing great. Okay. We've got like 22 minutes oh, left. Oh, good. So what about, you know, Kim asked in the beginning about step-by-step -step process of how to get started in private practice. I mean, I thought that tied in with your first was, well, how to get your LCSW. And we came up with some answers for her before you got back in, but uh, and it was primarily to get in touch with Dr. Miller because he is uh, Jay Miller. Yes, yeah, Jay Miller. Yes. Because I, and he actually spoke to one of our classes recently and talked about how one of his uh, research interests is licensing. I mean, because you have to have if you're a social worker in the state of Kentucky, you have to have a license, and so this is one of his areas of interest and. I'm sorry, what's your first name? I'm Debbie. Debbie said that he spoke to you guys in the MSW program? He spoke to um, one of our classes uh -huh. last spring. And it's a class that everybody has to take, so everybody got to hear. And all it, it was all about this procedure, yeah. the step-by-step -step process of, of how to get a license. And so maybe that's just the answer to the question. And, uh, it's all online and, on and, the and, Social Work Board website. And he is the chair of the Social Work Board. But Kim was saying that she was doing things online and not finding out what she needed to know. 
it, I just think it was hard to interpret without somebody sitting there where you could ask them some specific questions. Plus, she could call the social work board too, right? Sure. Yeah. They're they're not helpful. Yeah, I've heard that. Not, and yeah, I've heard that too. <laughs> no, really but it is on there. I mean, if you look at the, uh, I think it's called law regulation. I, yeah, I printed it out and yeah. I tried to. You just have to it. dig a little bit. Go ahead. Yeah. I've just, I mean, I've heard conflicting. Like, you have to wait until you've got, you have your degree to be able to take the licensing te test, or you can take it like four weeks before you graduate or two weeks before you graduate. I don't know. So Somebody in the back is nodding their head. Do you know? Oh, that? yeah, because at the VA, they gave us a whole backstory. But you can, you basically have to apply to take the licensure test, and you can apply. I worked it out like March 27th. You can apply <laughs> six to four weeks before. Okay. And what they do is they'll send you back a list of times and dates to take the test, which can be before we graduate. And you just give an unofficial transcript, and then you send a transcript after you graduate. Okay, that's helpful. CSW. And, and you're talking yeah, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Which you have to have to do your right. LCS yes. So, um, in the event that you don't have the good fortune of being hired somewhere where they will pay for your uh, observations for mm -hmm. supervision, um, you know, how do you find someone to supervise you? How much can that cost? Where are you actually then getting the experience since you're not doing anything at your day job? Um, well, it's been a while since I got mine, so <laughs> let me just throw that in. Um, I think I paid, uh, or the hospital paid my supervisor, I think it was like $35 an hour or something like that, and would come to the hospital and meet with me. So probably in that $35 to $50 an hour range, which again, that's why it's important to get somebody to do that for you if you can. Um, they have to be, uh, you know, you have to be working in a clinical setting, so that's, that's important. You don't want to just go work at some like general med hospital because you have to you know you have to be in a clinical setting uh, for your hours to count. You should keep meticulous um, count of your hours. Make sure you have a log because you may be asked. I heard this horror story about this student that did all this stuff. Her supervisor lost her records or she lost them or something, and they made her go back and do all of her supervision yeah. over again, wow. all 200 hours. Um, so that, that supervisor is really uh, responsible for your practice. And that's why I don't do it. I mean, I've done it some, but it worries me that I have to sort of sign off on other people's work. You know, I want to make sure that they are doing good work. And, you know, so it takes visiting where they're doing it. It takes a lot of time to be a good supervisor. And that's another good reason why you're better off to find um, an employer who will hire you and then pay for it because then they have to supervise you. <laughs> they don't have any choice. And so in the comp care setting, uh, part of, of the job description is that the LCSWs who are there have to do the supervision for those who aren't LCSWs. So uh, it, it just, you know, I, I think I have heard of people who went outside that little matrix, but I think it's fairly rare. I think most people, wouldn't you say, most people either, you know, are in a hospital setting or now, now, I don't know about the cabinet, though, because I don't know how they get their hours, because I thought the cabinet uh, provided that as well. So I think there's a list somewhere. I think I've heard this. Does that sound right to you? Maybe yeah, the Board of Social Work should have a list. A list of people who have had the, the training. The training and right. then supervise. Okay, there they have to, I think it's a yearly training you have to go to to supervise people. It's done by Edwin Hackney. I almost forgot this. I want y'all to really listen to this. Thursday is the Kentucky Society for Clinical Social Work membership drive. It's Thursday. It's at 5.30 to like 8 at this place called Copper Roo. Co Copper R-O-U-X. It's on Broadway, I believe. If you Google it, you'll find it. I'm going to be playing music there with my friend. Um, we're going to have fun. The Clinical, so you will meet, if you come to that, it's free, come to it, um, you'll meet lots of LCSWs, you can join the Clinical Society for 25 bucks for a year, you get the Psychotherapy Networker magazine, which is awesome, um, you'll meet them, they have book studies, they have like a community for clinical social workers, so it's third, this coming Thursday, Copper Roo. Um, I hope you can come. It's it's a great um, kind of socialization into the profession for what students. Do you play? 
What do I play? I play guitar, mandolin, banjo. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And my friend plays fiddle, so I play some bluegrass music. Before our time gets away, I wanted to ask you if you would say one thing that you really love about being a clinical social worker in private practice and one of the most challenging things for you, and I'll do the same. Well, I think you better go first then, since you already know the question. Oh, okay. Oh, you go first, let me think. Okay. okay. So for me, I love, um, I love the variability of the people that I see. I'm fascinated by people's stories. And um, that's what therapy is. You're listening to people's stories. And, um, you know, I, I, I should back up and say, you need to have a strong outside life to do this. Because I've had people, and I know you have too, walk out of my office really angry with me because, you know, we didn't, I didn't sort of say what they wanted to hear. And then last week I had a firefighter that I've been working with. This guy's a binge drinker and he was having affairs on his wife and all this stuff, and he just sort of came to this place in his life where he was really, I mean, he probably was gonna kill himself because he didn't know how to get out of this thing. And he started seeing me, and his wife started coming, and they're doing great, he's got these little kids, and I was finishing up with him last week, and he sort of, I said, you know, do you need to come back anymore? He's like, you know, I think I'm good right now. And he's like, you know, I just wanna let you know that you saved my life. And you saved my family's life. And you know, and I sort of said the thing, well, you know, I was just, you know, I was just here and you did the work. But I mean, that, that touched me. That affected me. And I've had other people say, you suck. You know, you don't know what you're doing. I hate you. you know, but so I, you know, I, I love that. That was very, I mean, I, I think I did really help him because I was just, the only person in his life that was really honest with him, and that's what he needed. So you can literally, you can change people's lives for the better. You can save people's life. If you have a suicidal person and you help them get where they need to go, you can save lives. The thing that's challenging for me is that it's a very solitary, sometimes lonely thing to sit in your office and, um, you know, this is why you need to have mentors in your life and you need to have a group of people that you can just, like the Clinical Social Work Society, that you can just talk to. Because, um, you know, many days we sit and listen to trauma and terrible, terrible things that have happened to people or that they've done. And I don't want to go home and take all that stuff to my wife. You know, she doesn't deserve that. She's a great listener, but I've got to find other ways. So I teach, I do consulting, I play music, I, you know, I have two sons, I, I, I'm real involved in their lives. So if you are a person that needs lots of like outside, like lots of strokes, I guess that's what I would say, you might struggle a bit. So that's my, yeah, how about you? Good story. Um, I thought, so what came to mind as you were talking, like we had a few minutes to, to bring something out from the inside. Um, I, I was uh, sorry that I, first of all, I think the whole story thing is fabulous because you are absolutely right. We are, not only are we listening to stories, but I am, I consider myself a story based therapist as well. So I tell stories, uh, I hear their stories, and I tell stories obviously without using names of other, of, the, of other clients and how to inspire my clients. And so I have a story about this that how I became a therapist. I was, um, on my third marriage, I was early 30s, maybe mid-30s, and um, I, I, you know, the first year was like a honeymoon, and then, then after the, into the second year of marriage, we started having some trouble, and I said, well, let's go see a marriage counselor or a couples counselor, and my husband said, sure, let's do it. And the thing was, i have been married twice before and had a couple of long-term relationships, and I had said that same line to every guy before. Uh, let's get marriage counseling, let's get couples counseling. And every one of them said, no way. And so, first of all, I knew right then that I had a different kind of guy on my hands. And he said, sure, sure, let's, let's go do it. So we went to this marriage counselor, and, uh, and uh, her husband actually worked here at the college. Her name was Pat, uh, Pat Wellen. So, uh, matter of fact, her, her license number is like three or something, okay? So and you, when you get your license, you, have, you get a number, right? And so she's one of the original LCSWs in Lansington. Wonderful lady. 
I still bump into her at CEUs. And, um, but right away, so, I'm, so we're seeing her, and, and, and I soon, within the third or fourth appointment, I realized that, that it really wasn't my marriage at all. It was really me. That I was feeling, you know, really lost and hadn't found my niche in the world and different sorts of things. And so I said, you know, I don't really need my husband here anymore. I think I just want to see you for myself, and I, I can take care of that. And so, so we did. So we did individual, and for a period of time, and at the end of that process, I said to her, you know, this has really changed my life. This has absolutely changed my life. And I want to be a part of this thing that changes people's lives. And so that's how it began. And um, so she said, well, you know, I said, now what kind of degree do you have? And, and she said, I'm a social worker. And uh, I don't even know if I even hardly knew what a social worker was, right? And so, but I had two years of college. And so uh, she said, my husband teaches at, uh, did you know him, Ken Wells? Teaches at the college and he's retired now. And uh, great guy, and so I came up here, spoke with people. You know, it was interesting when I first came to the uh, undergraduate, uh, talk, talking with people, Beth Romp, um, that I felt this um, caring about me that I had never felt in any other college program before. And so I really did feel like social workers in general have a different attitude about people and about relationships. You know, I've heard that's not always the case, uh, and I, and and at, at my uh, doctoral admissions um, committee me meeting, I said something like <coughs> that. I said, um, you know, I've ne never met a social worker that I didn't like, and one of the replies was, uh, your sample size is too small. <laughs> but anyway, so it's not always the case, but it certainly, is, you know, I I can I can say you know uh, that most all the social workers I've ever met, I've always liked, and I and I really love the field as well. So. So that's the cool part. Challenging part, I don't know, I'm racking my brain. I can't think of anything that, that, except for the part that you're saying about just self-care. I think that is important. As long as you've got that piece in there where you're taking care of yourself, you're not, in, you're not letting them tell you uh, how to run your business. Like, well, I have to see you at this certain time. You know, boundaries, you, yes. Boundaries, right. Boundaries, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let me say one more thing about that, and then we've got about seven more minutes for questions. Um, I see a lot of students who are very anxious about being a therapist, and they, they tell me, you know, I don't, I know I'm just going to screw up, and I'm going to be terrible, and, you know, there's lots of anxiety. What do you think the research literature says about the most important characteristics of effective therapy? What is it? That's part of it. Yeah, it's the relationship, right? It's not It's not if you're a cognitive behavioral therapist, psychoanalytic, existentialist. It's whether or not you connect with the person, you have a rapport with them, you care about them, um, and, and that they feel like you're helping them. That's the crucial variable, and that's, that's what's important. So, you know, I... The stuff, the, the techniques and that sort of thing, that will come over time. You'll learn what your style is. You know, I think maybe Jackie's style is probably different than mine, and that's okay. We all, we all that, again, that's why you interview a therapist before you go see them. Um, but you build up sort of this um, toolbox of things that you use, or you go to trainings, and you, you, you'll get that stuff. So I just want to say, don't, don't worry. That it's about really connecting with your clients. I feel like my clients are my friends. I keep those uh, boundaries so that they're not my friends. Good. That's an important detail. <laughs> but I but I feel like they are, and I think they feel that way about me too, and that they really feel like I really do care about them, and that I'm that I'm that I am a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Yeah. So good. Other questions? Yeah, it kind of that touches on what my question was like. You know, 50 hours away. I've been in this clinical setting where I haven't done a whole lot of sit down and one on one individual therapy. How do I know that I'm ready once I have my L? Or that you, you don't? Know, you <laughs> won't know. So, is it common for people to get into it without like going to uh, like make that their full time job? I don't know. I can't really answer that. Um, Especially with evidence based practice. And yes. I think that's why there's so much anxiety, like in group supervision. You know, it's like, well, yeah. what do we have? And, and I guess that also speaks to billing, like, too. How did, you know, because especially in this program, your, you know, evidence-based practice is so ingrained in you, but yet when you're released into the wild, you, you have a few CEOs, you know, that's, that's about it. Well, I mean, I can't, I've been a full-time faculty member 
for less than a year now. I mean, I've taught here a long time. Um, I think that's that's changing. We're trying to do more practice classes. I mean, in my classes, I do lots of role playing and kind of uh, experiential kinds of stuff. But you know, I think I think you just sort of have to trust yourself. Now, I would not. This is why I, I don't advise anybody to go directly from, you know, the minute you get your LCSW, go get yourself in an office and say, you know, here I am. I'm a, I, if you can, you know, do a little bit on the side as you're working your, your full-time job. I mean, we didn't mention things like, you know, health care and vacation and, all, you know, private practitioners, all that comes out of their pocket. And so if there's a way for you to sort of, Maybe ease work to ease it. into it. Do a couple of nights. That, that, that's more specifically yeah. my question. What yeah. is that way that you can ease into it? Like, well, once you get your LCSW, you look around for a private practice that you or a, another person, another LCSW. Mm -hmm. That's again. I was going to say that too. You guys know about the thing on Thursday night, right? right. Just throwing <laughs> that out there. Get some friends. Right. You get some friends right. and and open up or or be a. There are lots of private practices around. One of them is ours, Access Wellness Group, who are looking for part-time people. And that's not that's, so that's, that's, you know, you get a client who wants to come see you at 7 o'clock at night after work, and that's fine. Yeah. On a Saturday, it's just, you work that's what's out. confusing to me is that with that L, you have so much, it's almost like too much. Well, you, that's to why, really understand that's why, Jackie, you know, you have to set the parameters. <laughs> you have to figure out what you're comfortable with if you have a family you need to spend some time with them, you know, you don't need to work 50 hours at a job and then go work 20 hours at your private practice. Um, but meeting people and sort of, um, I guess I would encourage you to look at a, a, a private practice that's already developed and not just go out and, because they have a referral base and that's the lifeblood of private practice is that your name gets out and people get to know you. Um, you, and so when you're new, you have to kind of work on that. So then if you get into that and you are doing it part-time, do you have like a supervisor you meet with to go over your notes? And like, how do you know? So that's it's really just based on your retention is how they know that you're doing well. Well, that's the lonely and risky part. I mean, I teach ethics sometimes, and that's the risky part of being in private practice. Because, I mean, I could go into my office, and as long as I don't like sleep with one of my clients or, you know, beat them up or something, they might think I'm a nice guy, you know, yeah, that Blake Jones guy's kind of cool, he's nice, but not help, not do anything at all to help them. And nobody knows, nobody checks in on me or sets in with me. So you are kind of out on your own. So you have to take the initiative to, you know, go to CEUs and to always be developing, read, you know, listen to podcasts, be developing as a professional. And the CEUs are required as part of our licensing, renewing our license. And really, CEUs are fabulous. They are, they, I have learned so much. Matter of fact, I feel like in some ways, I learned more from the CEUs after I got out of the program about actual practice. Would you feel the same yes. way? Yes, that's where but you like learn you your techniques. Maybe things are changing in that way in yeah. the college, but definitely the CEUs are, are just, yeah. uh, you, you, nothing to compare those yeah. to. So once you get your LCSW, you can do whatever you want to do. You can build and do all of that stuff, but again, I want you to go back to what's best for you, what's the best situation. We've got a couple more minutes for questions. Social media. Social media. Um, just that, you know, I've got my Facebook, my professional Facebook page here. I don't um, friend my clients <coughs> on Facebook. Don't think that's a good idea. I don't want them knowing, you know. And I don't want to know that they got drunk on Saturday night, and, you know, it's all over Facebook. But professional, I have about um, 750 likes, people that like my Facebook page. I post on it every couple of days. I write things. I post little inspirational quotes. And so hopefully, you know, I, I do some Twitter. I find Twitter kind of annoying. But uh, Facebook's a, a good one, I think, for social I do have a blog, but I, uh, I have uh, my highest uh, monthly page view is 150,000. But since I'm in the doc program, I haven't been able to post on it. But I plan to, to revisit that as soon as uh, I'm finished, uh, hopefully before that. But I haven't really used it as a tool to uh, get referrals. Now, it turns out that I have had some people who have stumbled upon my blog and then called me as a result of that. But uh, I like to write. That's actually my niche. 
market that I'm looking at, I do like to write, and so at some point in the future, I would like to do more writing. So, um, but anyway, so what else with social media? So blogs and um, podcasts. Podcasts. You know, podcasts are easy to do. Uh, but just basically a, a business Facebook page, which I don't even yes, have. Right? Yes. My yes. daughter's been telling me I need that, but I. But, and so maybe you're inspiring me today. There you go. Go ahead, get that Facebook page. It's easily there. done. Right. It's free. <laughs> One more question. Is the billing side of things just horrible, or is it hard to learn and like? I don't have to do that. So <laughs> I, I told Blake that <laughs> that's what I was told before I. Uh, went into private practice, and by the way, I did have a friend. We were going to do it together. We were so excited, and then she backed out. So I went, well, I'm, I'm still going to do this. So, but um, I was told it was really horrible, all of this, and it's, it's very complicated. And you know, you do have to dot all your I's and cross all your T's with insurance companies. And you do have to follow up because periodically they'll miss one and things like that. And you have to keep a record of that. But there are nice little software packages now that take care of most of that for you, as well as your notes, put your notes in there. I was gonna throw out one other thing, speaking of the notes, that I, um, I accidentally, I, I, I heard something wrong from one of my clinical supervisors. She was, her husband was the head of psychiatry at UK, and she told me that, I thought she said that after he does a session, that he types the notes up, and then when the, when the client comes back in, he reads that note to them that he's just typed up. Turns out that wasn't exactly what she said, but that's what I thought she said. And so I started doing that. So I, my clients love my notes, and everybody, they all talk about them. And so I do a nice note, see I'm a writer, right? So I do this nice note after they leave, or so that's the last 10 minutes or so of the session, they're still, they're still wrapping things up and I'm starting to type. But I do this note, and then when they come back in, I read that to them. And I say, this is where we left off last time, make sure that we just are on the same page. And, and then that way they're reminded of what things we're working on and nothing gets left out. I can refer to those anytime I want to, but mainly it's also for their benefit as well. Turned out I, it was a completely different thing that I, than, than what I thought I heard, but I said, well, I've got a new technique. And so that's, that's the way that I do notes. I want to be sure to bring that up to you guys. Thank you. Well, guys, we're at one o'clock and I think we're gonna get kicked out of this room. Yeah, so this thank you for fun. your time. Um, I, my cards and things are over there. Do you want to give out your email or anything, address if people have, or just, you, I'll, if you want to send me an email, I can get Jackie's yeah. to you. Um, take some pizza with you. Good luck. Stay in touch with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Off the head,